everybody. Hi, welcome. It is episode number 90. This is Office Hours. You're in the audience and I'm in my office as usual. You see that? Look. Yeah, still in focus. Ooh, feels good. Welcome to episode number 90. This is Office Hours, a call in, email in, fill out a form, website advice show about tabletop role playing games and and predominantly the art of uh, playing specifically game mastering them though i'm finding that the the longer we do this show the the further we continue on in in episodes of office hours the less and less the questions become sort of how do i dm this thing y'all are getting more specific which is great and you're getting broader uh, about your questions which is interesting so it's like a much wider base so today we're going to be talking about someone having a problem with their game master so how do i deal with the gm we're going to talk about spatial relationships uh, in games and then we're going to talk about spies Ooh, spies so you might be thinking to yourself how does this work what is an office hours so Every week that we do an episode of Office Hours, I choose three questions from a pile of questions that have accumulated in my question answering inbox uh, that are submitted by you to my website, www.adam-coble.com. You can go there, click on the uh, the Office Hours link, fill in the form. Uh, several uh, several of, of our question askers submit their voice along with the question because you know what you don't have to but it's nice to be able to hear you today I will be I will be pinch hitting for one of the questions I'll be reading our, our first question uh, but the other two we've got your lovely voices to deliver your questions to me and to the audience and then we're gonna try to answer them or at the very least we're gonna get into a discussion about each of the questions and sort of what those questions say about Tabletop role playing games in general. A lot of the times people will ask questions that they think or feel are only applicable to them. They're like, you know what? Nobody else in the world is having this problem. This is my exclusive and explicitly singular problem at uh, tabletop, but chances are pretty good you're not alone. Um, it's always interesting looking at the comments on YouTube or seeing in chat when somebody says, this is the problem I'm having with my group watching all the comments be like oh yeah same or like i've played with a group like that or like i feel your pain that sucks that's really cool for me because it to me it feels like a good opportunity to kind of address some common problems we all run into now this this first question i'm going to read it uh, for alexis here so alexis submits our first question today and it's about having a problem not with your group uh not with the game but with your game master, how do we handle a game master with with some some problems? So here's our first question. Hey, Adam, I have an issue with the way our DM runs our group and need advice on how to voice my concerns. For context, our group consists of seven people, the DM and six players, three male, three female. Our group plays weekly, sometimes twice weekly in real life. Our DM has a bad habit of killing campaigns. And by killing, I mean ending them between sessions because he's bored of the story or wants to do something new. I understand that some campaigns just don't work out, but it's the frequency that this occurs that is the issue. We'd be lucky if a campaign lasts 10 sessions. As a player, I find it hard to get invested in the game when there's a good chance that between the end of the current campaign uh, session and the next one, I'll receive a message saying, new campaign next week, bring a new character. There are so many characters I've put time and effort into writing backstory and motivations for who have ended up getting used three times and getting shelved without me being able to expose any of the work I've done to the rest of the group. How do I voice my issues and concerns to the DM and how do we fix the current state of the group? So, yeah, I mean, I think like 10 sessions for a lot of people might feel like a good amount of time to play, right? There, there used to be, uh, there used to be a, a sort of generalized complaint that if you can make characters with your group, you've done more than most groups get to do, right? There's this idea that that campaigns just naturally fall apart, and I think that in a lot of ways, yeah, that that is the case, right? A lot of ways, scheduling, uh, momentum, more than scheduling, I think momentum is the issue, right? Where if you get together every week. And then somebody misses an episode or they miss a session. And now you, I don't know, you get together, and you play board games, you do a one shot, whatever, no big deal. And then 
The next session, somebody else can't make it. So you just call it. Then the next session, somebody else has to reschedule. And then you miss that week. And then everybody gets together the next week. But nobody really wants to play a game. And your momentum dissolves. And that's more than scheduling. That's what happens, right? I think more than scheduling, it's the like you drop one player, then you drop another player, then you get that first player back and things slowly kind of grind to a halt until eventually nobody really cares anymore. It's been eight weeks since the last time you played, but it doesn't sound to me like that's Alexis's problem, right? Alexis gets to play twice a week sometimes with the same group in the same campaign. That's pretty great, right? The problem that Alexis is having is that one of the players in this group has a problem staying attached to the same concept, the same campaign. Now, I'd be lying if I wasn't uh, if I wasn't open about the fact that this happens to me. But up here, right? I, as a GM, I get uh, I get interested in other games. Uh, I get um, drawn away by novelty. And I'm, I'm susceptible to this kind of stuff, right? Especially because I'm a GM who likes reading about other games. I'm a GM who likes engaging in other material. I'm not somebody who's going to say, I took the time to learn 5th edition d and I will never play anything else. That's the opposite of how I work. But the thing is, is that, you know, if you've committed to something, if you have agreed as a group to do something... This becomes not a GM issue. This becomes not a tabletop RPG issue. This becomes a personal relationship issue, right? If you strip out all the role-playing game stuff here, the problem is still the same. And fundamentally, this question would be equally at home on Hot for Teacher. Because what's happening here is the violation of the social contract. Everybody's sitting down. And they are making characters for a role playing game in which progression and long term play is assumed. Right. I don't know what games they're playing. I don't know if they're switching games between uh, campaigns. I don't know if it's just a bunch of different 5e games, but I kind of have to assume a baseline when I answer these questions. So I'm going to assume you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, which means you're not playing one shots. You're not playing mini series. D&D wants you to make characters and then play forever. Right. They want you to just play until you run out of D&D to play and then make new characters. That's how the game is designed. When I say they want you to, I mean the mechanisms of the game, the, the design of the game wants that. So you you're sitting down with your friends, you're making characters, you're preparing for this campaign experience. And like five weeks later, your GM gets bored and says, I am, I'm not going to GM this anymore, right? That's what's happening. It's not, the GM doesn't get to say things like, new campaign next week, bring a new character. The, the GM doesn't have that, that right. You cannot, as a GM, just say that to your players without it being a violation of a greater social contract, which was, this is a campaign we've all agreed to play on. If your GM reaches out and says, hey, everybody, I'm getting bored of this campaign, here's why, can we solve this problem together? That's a more appropriate response, right? The GM just saying, I refuse to GM, I'm out, is the social equivalent of buying everybody tickets to a movie and then 10 minutes before the movie is supposed to start, everybody's there and then not showing up, right? Saying like, ah, I bought all these tickets, but you know what? I'm just, you know, I can't make it guys. And everybody's already at the theater and they're, they're ready to go watch the movie and get some popcorn. And the GM has just yanked the rug out from under them and said, you know what? It's not happening. We're not doing it. The response to new campaign next week, bring a new character should be no. Like that's not what we agreed to like back the fuck up. Hold on a minute, right? Because what's happening here is there is this this abuse, intentional or otherwise, of what we perceive to be the traditional player GM authority structure, right? We're, we're watching a player in the group manipulate their right as a, as a player in the same way. Okay, imagine if a player did this, right? Imagine if, uh, you know, we were about to we were about to go go live with a new episode of Court of Swords and uh JP said to me, I'm making a new character. 
you can't do that either, right? It, it totally throws off the, the flow of the game. We, we get into this position where because we are a GM, we think that we get this ability to do whatever we want, right? That like, I'm in charge of the game, says so right in the name, I'm the dungeon master. I'm doing all the real work anyway, so I should be able to just decide when I'm done doing that work. Now, this isn't to say that the GM should play a game they don't want to play, right? This isn't to say that the GM, if the GM is getting bored every five weeks and doesn't want to play this anymore, the GM should say that and should explain why. The GM should say, I'm bored of this game, or it's not as much fun as I thought it was going to be, or whatever. It doesn't sound to me like switching campaigns is solving that problem. And let's talk about this for a second. The assumption that it's a problem at all might want to be addressed as well, right? Because maybe the DM doesn't think that this is a problem. Maybe the DM isn't getting bored. Maybe the DM is just like, I play 10 sessions and then I'm done. I want to do something different. And that is also okay. The problem is buy-in, right? We talk about buy-in all the time and how important it is. If your dungeon master says to your six players while you're making characters, all right, everybody, we're going to do 10 sessions with these characters, and then we're gonna make new characters. You and all have the right to buy in, right? To say, yes, that's fine, I like that, let's do it. But you have to do that first. You have to do that in advance. Because the game's assumption and the cultural assumption around Dungeons and Dragons particularly is that you are going to play a, a infinite, un specified number of sessions. Now, if this is happening, if this is happening around a game like Apocalypse World, right? If you get to 10 sessions of Apocalypse World and the GM says, okay, we're done. Sure, that's that's fine. That's how that game is structured, but it still needs to make sense, right? You, you need to talk about it as a group. So I think the the real solution, right? The real fix here is as it so often is, Alexis, like sit down with your players all together and be like, I am personally having this problem. Is anyone else feeling this way? Right now, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you're if, if everybody else says no, if everybody else is like, yep, this is this is great. We love it. We love the, the chaos. We love switching campaigns all the time. Alexis, you are the one who is who is an odd person out. That might be the case, and maybe you need to find another group. If you're the only one that's having this problem, you either need to suck it up or find a different group to play with. But if other players are having the same balance, it's worth having the conversation, right? Explaining, you know, I, I put all this time and effort into making these characters. I feel like I don't get to a chance to play that out. Can we fix this? Can we play a campaign that lasts a long time? Does anyone want to run a campaign that will last longer than 10 sessions? What can we do? Can we adopt a, a seasonal model and we switch GMs, right? So when Barry, the board game master, decides after 10 sessions, yeah, Barry doesn't want to run this game anymore, then somebody else, like Larry, the long suffering, Larry can be like, all right, Barry, give me that campaign. I'm going to run it until Barry decides, you know what? I want it back. Give it to me. That that's certainly a thing you can do, right? You can start to you can start to like rotate through GMs to give Barry a chance to to you know recharge. I'm gonna I'm gonna I, and I don't do this very often, but I'm gonna devil's advocate just a little bit, Alexis. So there's a there's a sentence in this in this question that kind of made me cringe a little, not because I think it's despicable or because I think Alexis is wrong, but because personally, I think there is a player level solution for this kind of thing that, that could be implemented in addition to the DM stuff, right? Obviously, the problem here is the DM pulling the rug out from out of the players. That's the real issue. But Alexis, when you said... Uh, there are so many characters that I have put time and effort into writing backstory and motivations for who have ended up getting used three times and then getting shelved without me getting to expose any of the work I've done to the rest of the group. That for me raised, it raised a red flag. I felt a little red flag waving around when I read that because you are still doing the thing despite the fact that you know your DM 
doesn't take that into account or care about it, right? So you know by now that this DM is probably going to bail on this campaign. You've chosen to continue to play, right? You've chosen to continue to play, but also you're still performing the same behaviors, right? Like this is this is one of those situations where if this were a hot for teacher question, it would be like somebody I know uh, refers to me by an embarrassing nickname that I don't like, but I refuse to say anything to them. I won't tell them. I'm just going to let them continue and I'm not going to express my boundaries. I'm just going to keep and I'm going to keep I'm going to keep engaging in the same relationship with them and I'm not going to bring it up. I just I, I just feel bad and I want to complain about it. So that's fine. You can feel bad and complain about it, but but stop. Stop it. Stop putting time and effort in. Stop making complicated backstories. Stop creating preset motivations for your characters. Throw all that stuff out. Right. The survival mechanism here. If you're not if you're not going to have the conversation and try to get the DM to get their shit together, the point here is that instead make a character with no backstory, make a character with no motivation, create a character that is only just like the simplest, most like one note. What is this character got for me? Like for me, a character starts as a D&D character will start as a class I've never played before or a build I'm interested in or uh, yeah, it's the it's the Chungus versus Grungus problem again, right? I think that this is a situation in which pick one thing you're interested in and then let that character blossom in action. Do not spend 20 hours writing up a complex backstory that you at this point know, you understand in this framework you are currently playing in, you you know they're never going to see the light of day. You're not, you're going to get nothing. You're going to get 10 episodes, 10 sessions of information out of them. So don't waste your time anymore, right? Stop stop doing that. Instead, find a thing that is interesting to you. Plant that seed and then let it grow. Don't come to the table with a full tree already. Yeah, it's very, very liberating and it can be really fun and it can help you adapt to this kind of thing. Because by the time you get to that 10th session and the GM says, well, we're done. Instead of saying, ah, shit, my my to do list of of tragic backstory reveals, I only got two things checked off. You know, you only found out that the masked man killed my family and that I have my father's broken sword in my backpack. I never even got to tell you about how my mom was the chosen sorceress, but then she was sacrificed by the Necrolord and the Necrolord works for Lord Bane skull of dark fist manor and and Bane skull dark fist manor was built on a graveyard that was made by ancient kobolds and the kobolds had a pact with the dragon and the dragon built the city that my family was born in you see my great great grandfather nobody needs that stop it fucking stop just stop it's not it's not doing anybody any favors it's not doing you any favors it's not doing your campaign any favors Come to the table and be like, yo, I'm a chaotic neutral elf fighter. And the GM will be like, okay, cool. What else do you know about your character? You'll be like, I I don't know or care, right? Now, I, I don't know that there are, I don't know that there are any, uh, I can't think off the top of my head of any games that necessarily require that you do all this backstory work, like even, even uh, Burning Wheel, right? Even in Burning Wheel, which has a massive, deep-seated character creation system, that's character creation. That's part of playing the game. You do that, and and that's it. You know, you you have a you have a past, but I wouldn't call it a backstory. I hate backstory. Backstory is on my list of like forbidden tabletop RPG words, right? Like. Backstory, uh, immersion, immersion is another one that goes on the forbidden words list. I need to, I need to make this list somewhere because I think backstory is one of these things that, that really fucks people up when they try to make a character. You don't need it. You don't need any backstory. You don't need that. You can, you can have an idea. You can have a, a, a thought, a concept. You can have some things you want. You can have stakes questions, but I think backstory is a straitjacket, right? Backstory is there to bind you to a particular universe, right? It's there to bind you causally to something that you uh, that you you don't you don't know about yet, right? Like 
we we make backstory to cancel out the sort of Schrodinger's character problem where I would rather discover why my character is doing something after they do the thing than have a 40 page backstory that lets me know what I should do. So I would say, and I don't, again, I don't know, this isn't about Alexis's character creation process. Maybe, maybe the, the culture of the, of their table, maybe Alexis's table's culture is everybody comes to the table with backstory and Alexis is the only one that is getting pissed off. And that's totally fair, right? I'm just saying, if that's not the case, or even if it is, like, try, try that. Try, try this as a, a balm for not getting to play your character very long, because then 100% of what your, your play experience is, it'll mean something. You're not going to be missing out. You're not going to be looking at that checklist, hoping that you'll have an opportunity, maybe in, in session 40, to reveal your, your dark secret, right? Like, as a, as a personal example, to give a personal specific example, I, the last time I played a character for any length of time, so let's say Dr. Grigori, right, in the West Marches campaign, Dr. Grigori had no backstory originally, none. I was just like, I want to win at D&D, so I'm going to be a chaotic evil character so I can get away with D&D shit, and I want to play a cleric because I like being clerics, and I'm going to pick the kind of cleric that's going to get me the most likelihood of surviving and winning. I want to not die and accumulate XP. That's all I cared about. And then when I started playing, I was noticing things that I found interesting about the character, right? I was like, okay, why are they evil? Let's figure it out. Uh, I started developing ideas about what the character was like because I needed justifications for things that had already happened in the narrative, right? Things I had already done. So it wasn't like this old man is annoying me and he's in my way. And I'm going to kill him because I know in chapter three of the Dr. Grigori story, Dr. Grigori was kicked by an old man one time and now he hates old men. So that's why I'm going to do it. Instead, I was like, I want to get some XP for killing this dude. Plus, I think he has potions I want. I, I kill him. And then later, I'm like, OK, why would I have done that? Right. I know why I did it as a player. I did it because I wanted XP and potions. But why would my character do it, right? And this is this is sort of fundamentally the difference between like write, a, a sort of writer approach versus a kind of make em ups approach where you just kind of figure it out as you go. Why did this happen? Let's justify it. And then you you let it flow together. So you 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 do things in game and then you figure out why you did them rather than having motivation to do them and then letting that determine what you're doing. You know, this this happens on a micro scale in D&D with alignment where people will say Listen, next time you have a conversation with your group about alignment, listen to the way that people talk about it, right? Do they say, I did this because I am chaotic neutral? Or is it, I'm chaotic neutral, so I am going to do these things? Do we think of it as prescriptive or descriptive, right? So this idea of kind of how we structure what we think of our characters. So that that's something that could help, Alexis, on your end. That's something you could do without having to like engage your, uh, your GM without having to engage the GM and say like, do this thing, stop doing this. If you just want to like help yourself, but you don't necessarily need to change the structure of the game, go ahead and go ahead and do that. But also your GM's being a dick and it needs to be addressed. Right. I think the point is to, to sit down with your group and have the same conversation you just had avec moi a poor la group, right? So sit down with them and say, here's what we need. This is why I'm finding this frustrating. What is going on? And then just, just go from there, right? But it is tough. Uh, and be ready. Be ready for, uh, no, this isn't bothering any of us. This is just you. It might be a play style thing. I don't know. I, I hope you can, I hope you can have this conversation with your group. And if not, I hope that you can find a way to play with these folks that is good for, for everyone. Um, but yeah, lots of, lots of good suggestions, uh, in, in chat as well today. I, I hope, I hope you find what you need. Let's get in on our second question. Now this, this question is interesting because it, I'm, I'm going to need your help determining kind of what, what Chris wants me to say here. Let's, let's talk about this. Hi Adam. My name is Chris. And I was wondering about alternate techniques for 
representing spatial like relationships besides the kind of overhead view, bird's eye view map. I would like to explore something different, something that doesn't so detached um, for the players. And I was wondering if you had any ideas. Thank you. So first of all, Chris, thank you. Thank you. So look at how, look at how concise this question is. Mwah. Ooh, Chris. <laughs> so this is a question about like, yeah, how do we, how do we represent relationships between things in the imagined space of our role playing games? Now, I guess we can talk about a bunch of different tools. We can talk about different methods. I, I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. I'm going to talk about stuff from different games, right? I'm not necessarily going to be like treating this like D&D, but there's, there's a bunch of different ways to handle this in game. And then we can talk about kind of using this stuff either in D&D or generally. So obviously the scale map is, I would say the most common, right? The scale map is the most common uh, of these tools where it's, I drew a map, one inch is five feet, go to town. Now it might be a gridded map, so it might be like, you are five squares away from another character, right? You are six squares or 30 feet away from a tree, right? It might be that. It might be a gridded map. It might not. It might be a blank map where you measure it like you're playing a war game. So instead of saying one, two, three, four squares, you measure the distance between two objects and say, okay, multiply that. It's five inches. Multiply that by five feet, right? That's a way you can do it. So Gridded map, not gridded map. That's those are the the kind of core ones. Whether the map uses squares or hexes, it doesn't it doesn't matter, right? Those things are uh, that is the common spatial map. We've been using it for as long as role playing games have been a thing, and that's what we default to in a lot of ways, right? So, other ways that games do this. The next one is a, instead of a objective distance map, and I was, it's interesting that this came up because I was talking about this with Jesse Cox last night, right? So Jesse is running a new, uh, new Star Wars game soon, and we were talking about this as part of a Patreon video about the difference between uh, absolute measurement and like relative measurement or like objective measurement and then subjective measurement. So in Genesis, and in uh, the Star Wars, Fantasy Flight Star Wars games, and in um, Warhammer Fantasy 3rd Edition, I think maybe Warhammer 4th as well, they use relative distance. So it's not, it doesn't matter that I am five feet away from the light stand over there. It matters that I am in close range with the light stand. I'm at close range with the light stand. I'm engaged with the microphone. I am at medium range from my bedroom and I'm at long range from my car, right? So there are these layers of relative distance. And what you have to do when you're measuring that is instead of measuring the distance between two objects, you have a single central questioning object and you figure how far away any given thing is from that. Right. So we're looking at it's my turn. And so I'm looking at where I am in distance from things. But if it was the microphone's turn or the lamp's turn or it was my car's turn, we would shift to that entire map to know what is uh, at distance from what. Right. So that's another way to do it. It's abstracted. It measures relative distance. I find that it is uh, better in some ways, then then it depends on how tactical the game is and sort of what you're thinking about. I find that range bands or things like that, those kind of like r relationships and, and stuff, they're useful when your game is sort of more cinematic and when you're snapping perspective around. Um, I think it creates a very, um, I think it creates a very, a very focused idea of like, it's your turn. Where is everything around you? Let's move on. But... It's hard to know and can be hard as a GM to balance all of that stuff when you have multiple players asking you things. So it's easy in an absolute map to measure player A to player B, player B to player C, but 
it can be a little tricky when you're trying to measure that outside of of that perspective, right? So you're like, if it's pl- so player B is at close range to player A and long range to player C, and you have to be able to think abstractly so that when you switch to player C, you can say, okay, if I'm medium range to player B, then I must be ergo, I must be long range with player A, right? So having to move the the perspectives around, that can be tricky, but I think that it is uh it's a it's a useful way of measuring those things. And it, it really it depends on how your how your brain works, right? Um so I think those two are kind of the uh, like absolute measurement and um, absolute measurement and relative measurement are uh, useful ways of, of doing kind of mapping and, and managing that stuff. Right. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think Ryutama does something kind of like this where it's like um, frontline backline and you kind of move kind of like a, f- a Final Fantasy, like a Super Nintendo Final Fantasy game. Um, so that's a form of relative distancing. Um, you can also do theater of the mind. So in theater of the mind, you theater of the mind is a style of D and D play. I think it's a silly way of describing it because everything is theater of the mind, but whatever the, the way that, that that kind of combat is, is it's narrative combat. It's thinking about and describing how far away you are without measuring stuff, which to me feels like, counter to the point of some games like i i wouldn't use theater of the mind combat in pathfinder or 5e if i could help it the only time i would ever use that style is if i didn't already have a map prepared and i really needed to do something right so the, that style of uh, of combat especially in dungeons and dragons removes the map altogether places the map in the brain and then you have to describe in fairly tight detail where things are without necessarily using map. Now you can draw them. You can just like do a little squiggle on a piece of paper and be like, you're this far away and you got to go over here and whatever. But if you're doing that, you might as well just use a map, right? Um, there are some, some pretty good kind of think pieces or articles online about how to do narrative combat. Um, Sly Flourish has a pretty good one that is like about how many people you can affect with certain things. It turns AOEs into like a narrative form, which is useful. But honestly, I just don't, I, it runs kind of counter to the game. I think it's, it's sort of bad advice when D&D says you don't really need to use a map. Cause like, good luck running an encounter for four 20th level characters and all of the things they need to fight without having a map. You're going to get in a lot of arguments. But we're not here to debate the the value of any given system. We're just going to talk about a bunch of alternatives. So if we look at a game like Fate, right? If we look at a game like Fate, we can see something that's a bit like the range bands, but you set it up like a map. Fate uses what are called zones. And so a zone, uh, you would you would draw or represent with cards or whatever, an area. So a zone, depending on the scope, like how zoomed in or how zoomed out you are, the, the scope determines the, the zone. So in a gunfight, say you, um, you're you playing a, like a 1920s like bootlegger game, and the cops have come to raid your, uh, your warehouse where you have all your whiskey that you were gonna load on a boat and take to America. And so the cops come in and they bust in, and now you're having a gunfight. It's all Tommy guns and, and pistols, and we're shooting across the warehouse you're going to define the zones within the warehouse as being the most significant. So you're going to say outside is a zone. You're going to maybe say the main floor is a zone. You're going to say the foreman's office is a zone and the catwalks are a zone. And if you want to get from one zone to another, you can move, but you understand based on your kind of block map, you understand the distances between each zone. You can't go straight to the catwalk, right? You have to go from the floor onto the stair zone and then into the catwalk zone. You understand how they relate to each other. And this might be by writing um, zones down on the table, like writing on a piece of paper, putting it down on the table and laying them out that way. It might be a flow chart, right? This zone is connected to these two zones and you can scale it in and in and out, right? You can zoom in and out on this this model depending on your needs as, uh, as a GM. So 
if the gunfight in the warehouse is actually only a small part of a much larger uh, crackdown on the neighborhood, you might have the warehouse as a zone, you might have the back alleys as a zone, you might have the Sixth Street Bridge as a zone, and you might have your mafia headquarters as a zone, and each zone has stuff going on in it that you can't affect from the other. And it, this gives you ideas about like abilities and how fast something can travel. And it lets you uh, it lets you do that. It, it creates a sort of semi abstracted version of the universe. And then because of the way and this is a, a feature of um, uh, of this game, because of the way fate works, you can assign aspects to each. To each zone. Right. So you can say the warehouse has an aspect that is dark and dank. And the alleys have an aspect that is labyrinthine, right? Uh, so you can you can compel and invoke those. Yeah, an outdoor zone might have rain. Exactly. So, so these are these are ways to uh, to to represent that um, in in combat. But it doesn't even have to be combat, right? This represents both combat, but also location. So you would break up a city. In the same way, you could break up a city into different neighborhoods. You could zoom out and break a country down into different provinces, right? So these are things that you can do. Uh, there's a, a fractalization that happens in Fate that allows for this kind of thing that you don't see. Like D&D &D doesn't use a bird's eye view tactical map for the world. It uses a hex map, right? Um and I, I think I think if you wanted to, you could use you could hack the fate aspect like that. You could you could hack zones into D&D &D pretty easily. If you wanted to do it, but it, it's not it's not something that's innate like to that uh, to that system. And, and like anything else, it requires it requires hacking. Right. So. The thing that I was sort of caught up on this question is it says, what are alternatives to representing spatial relationships in the setting besides a bird's eye view map? There aren't any. Like, I mean, when we talk about if we want to assume, I assume that Chris means in the setting of your game, not like what can we use instead of a map to represent the world? I can't. I mean, that's why we have maps, right? I guess you could have a globe. You could apply zones to your map of the world but honestly i don't think people think about the world map that much unless the game is explicitly about travel in which case look at games like iron sworn look at games like uh ryutama games like um i mean honestly or original DD had uh what was it called outdoor adventures you had to buy a separate board game to do overland travel using DD. &D. I think the thing, the thing about it, there's no alternative to a war, a world map because nobody, we don't engage with it in the same way. Unless you're playing, unless you're playing a game like Mistara, or you are playing a game where you are feuding warlords, in which case the action isn't gonna be at the character level anyway, and there's a system for for zooming that out, right? Um you know, you can you can look at um I guess the other the other system, one of the other systems that that is worth noting is um, uh, relative distance adapted to um, relative distance adapted to the game's mechanisms, right? So when we talk about the distance between Baldur's Gate and Candlekeep, the game cares most about the real world distance between those things. It's 150 miles, right, down the road. But your game might abstract the world map into other measures of distance. So maybe we know that on an average trip, the distance between Baldur's Gate and Candlekeep is five rations, right? You got to spend five rations. Now, that allows you to travel between those areas based on another currency, right? Something else that you have to use to get you there. Hey, this is watching your, your supplies dwindle. This is the, um, the Banner Saga transit system, right? Where we don't really care whether it's 10 miles or 1,000 miles. We care based on units of in-game fuel, and it might be literal fuel, in this case, rations, feed for horses, 
gasoline for cars, right? This is a, a four tank journey or whatever. That takes the the distance and abstracts it into something the game actually cares about, right? And I think that's interesting. If your game if your game wants that, if your game wants to abstract that and does abstraction in other ways, I think that's great because it allows you to make rolls that can either increase or decrease the amount of fuel it requires to get from one place to the other, right? How much does this journey cost us versus how much uh, how much time will it take? Now, those are both just measures of uh, narrative space, right? Like a map represents there's a danger of going like deeply Baudrillard here and like getting into the whole map versus territory when, when Baudrillard would have lost his mind if we had showed him Dungeons and Dragons, because it would have been like, there's the territory, there's the map of the territory. There's the fictional imagining of the map of the fictional imagined territory, which in and of itself represents nothing. There is no desert of the real in a role playing game. We are imagining a false place and then attempting to correlate that false place to a map which is in of itself also false. And imagined in the mind of a person that doesn't exist. It is a it's a, a, a deeply strange way of of trying to figure this stuff out. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's, it's the play within Hamlet. But like. Yeah, the actors playing Hamlet are playing a role, imagining a lie, while they themselves are performing a lie for an audience. So the thing to remember, right? I think the thing to remember here is what do you want your map to do, right? Does your map exist to furnish a simplified or clearer version of combat? Does your map exist to create narrative tension between spaces? Does your map exist to tell you how much you might be risking going between one place and another, right? Because remember, and and I I talk about this in role-playing games all the time, the only thing that really matters in a role-playing game is choice, right? What choices we make, what help us to make those choices, and what the consequences of those choices are, right? So if I know it is a a 10 ration journey to go from here to the borders of Elfland, I'm going to then connect to the narrative and say, okay, so I need, uh, I need to buy these rations, uh, I need to carry these rations. I need to uh, I need to understand what I'm going to do if I run out part way because I know that the rules of this game will move the move the the ration number up or down. How do I plan for that? And what choices do I make? Right? What sacrifices? What roles? What abilities do I have to engage to get me there? Right? Now this can be done with rations, but it can also be done with like literal measurement, right? Because we just have to do that extra step. If you know that the distance between Baldur's Gate and Candlekeep is 150 miles, and you can calculate how many miles a day you can travel, and then you can calculate how much food you need per day, then it becomes a ration journey just the same, right? It just takes those extra steps and in a in a ration measurement system, cuts it and throws it out. Now, you can you can break this down into pretty much any game or non game setup. Right. So you could make this deeply tied to a mechanism or you could have it not tied to any specific mechanism. You could have it be in encounter likelihood. Right. So you could look at a journey and say, all right, it's going to take them. Ten rolls on a random encounter table to get there, right? So then we're measuring in potentia instead of relative distance or object spent or whatever, right? So you can roll. It might be that nothing happens. It might be that you go from Baldur's Gate to Candlekeep and you don't run into any kind of issue, but there is a chance, right? So it really depends on the game you're playing and what you want the map to represent and how it's going to communicate, not only as a narrative object, but as a ludographical object, right? What does the map represent in the game? So D&D, the map is, the world map represents kind of nothing. It's not that important unless you're playing like Tomb of Annihilation, but the scene map, that is important. That's very important, right? 
So think about what the map in this case represents, what you were trying to, to impel, and then look at the games that you're playing and see what they what they want and try to understand why they need like that to be the thing. Because remember too, like you're you're balancing two separate priorities. You're balancing your requirement as a game master to compel narrative in your players' brains, to let them know how far they're going, right? But it's also your job to pace the game, right? To frame scenes, to end scenes, to make things move. Like for example, let me give you let me give you an example from yesterday's episode of uh, Avernus. I'll try to keep it spoiler free. The players had to go from one place to another, and the adventure said to me there are like three random encounters between here and there. And I looked at the adventure and I said, you know what? These encounters are interesting and I'm not going to, I'm not going to skip them, but I don't want, I want the, the players to have a minute. I want to get them away from area A, get them to area B, and then I'm going to repurpose these encounters. Instead of being on the road, they're going to be at area B because my job was in that moment to decide the pacing of the game, right? To decide we need to move on, we need to push forward instead of continuing to slow things down. So in this case, it was irrelevant. The map itself meant nothing, right? For me, it was abstracting like hurdles, basically, right? Hurdles meaning the things you need to jump over, obstacles between here and your goal. Right? Like the goal in, in hurdles isn't to jump over as many hurdles as you can. It's to get to the end as fast as possible while jumping over the hurdles. So part of being a GM is deciding where those hurdles go. So pulling them, pulling those encounters out, allowing the players a little bit of time to breathe and then reinserting them into another part of the game was me manipulating the map in this case where that map was the journey from, from Baldur's Gate to Candlekeep isn't 150 miles, it's three encounters long. So for me, I just cut those encounters, and now the distance from Candlekeep to Baldur's Gate is one piece of box text, right? Five days later, tick, 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 right? So in this case, the map didn't matter. It was irrelevant. So I think the thing is, you've got to figure out what your maps are for, Chris, and then use them for those things. Right. Um, hopefully I've given you some options. Right. Hopefully you've got some idea around what other games might do. But there are uh, there are tons of uh, tons of options out there for uh, for different ways of measuring distance in role playing games. Um, I couldn't possibly even if I devote a whole episode to it, I couldn't possibly cover all of them. So, yeah, do some research, dig around, start a start a thread on your favorite RPG forum and be like, what's your favorite RPG map thing? Right. How do we how do we measure stuff in games? Yeah. If you want to see zones in action, uh, you can watch Nebula Jazz. Right. We use them in that. If you want to see the range bands in action, uh, watch Jesse's new show or go back and watch uh, Balance of Power. Uh, I've used both of those in live games. Uh, we did Ryutama on Roll20 Presents. I've played uh, I think I've played all of these games on online somewhere. So if you want to see it in action, please go and go and do that thing. Uh, let's move on to our third question from Namhart. Hey Adam, I'm designing a game right now that I'm calling Silencer, which is a spy infiltration game inspired by classic spy movies and media, as well as taking some inspiration from all the different systems I've loved over the years. I don't want to get too into it, but the main mechanic is a multi-phase system where each mission has two phases. During the first phase, the characters infiltrate the enemy stronghold and attempt to complete the mission and escape stealthily. During the optional second phase, if the characters are discovered or otherwise trip the alarm, then their secondary classes activate and the pacing accelerates, turning the tone into much more of an action game. So, for example, a player might be a spy slash soldier a gadgeteer slash grenadier, or a mask slash driver. My question is mainly a design question, but also extends into how we handle tone as GMs in general. Do you have any recommendations on how we can transition from quiet, tension-filled moments to action-packed, high-stakes moments smoothly? Can we set the juxtaposition 
so it's not as jarring when we transition from, say, exploring Strahd's castle to fighting the animated rug? Or is it that the jump between these two moments are good, and the more we try to smoothly transition between them, the more we take away the explosion of tension that is, this is the threat, deal with it now, action. Thanks, and remember, you're awesome. So, I mean, D&D does this kind of already, right? Like, we have two phases, right? Two phases in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, one phase is the bullshit, nothing matters, jerk off elf voice phase, right? The other part is where the game comes in and we fight monsters. Now, sometimes during jerk off elf time, we roll skill checks and like maybe, maybe we like accidentally step in a trap or something if we're in a dungeon, but mostly it's just a bunch of like wanking around and like not doing anything, right? When we roll initiative, that's when the game says, yo, shut up and jumps in and is like, all right, now I'm going to try to kill you. Now you get to use all your abilities. Now you get to like bring out the map. We roll initiative. It's the, it's literally because this, this was inspired by D and D it's the, it's the initiative role, right? It's the final fantasy. Everything goes blurry. We, and now it's a fight roll initiative, use your skills, do your abilities. It becomes, it becomes the game. And then when the fight's over, we go back to jerk off wank around elf time and go back and forth between those two phases, right? Now, there is nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all, right? The movies that Namhart is describing, right? The, the core material from which Namhart is deriving inspiration works pretty much the same way, right? There is phases built into the game's structure, right? There is uh, getting the mission, there is going on the mission, there is sneaking, there is failing to sneak, there's action, and then sometimes there's more sneaking, action, sneaking, action, sneaking, climax, the end, right? But I absolutely think that a phased approach works fine, right? Now, Namhart, I know that you've read Blades in the Dark. I'm not gonna tell you. You should go read Blades, because... But I think failing, failing to sneak is not... This is the weird thing, okay? So let's talk about stealth in Dungeons and Dragons. So you're like, I'm gonna sneak up on this orc. And the GM says, okay, cool, roll stealth. And you roll stealth, the GM checks the orc's passive perception and says, you sneak up on the orc, or you don't. But if you don't, you have failed to sneak up on the orc. You failed to sneak up on the orc, right? So rolling stealth is a fail or succeed thing. But there's no there's no given. There's no assumed like one way or the other in spy fiction failing failing to sneak is not a, a it's not bad. I mean, it, narratively, it is right. If you ask James Bond, like he's sneaking through Dr. No's lair and he accidentally steps on a discarded champagne flute and the champagne flute breaks and one of Dr. No's guards turns around and starts shooting it at James Bond with his machine gun. Right. Bond himself would would say to you he had failed, right? Like, oops, I failed. But the movie's producers, the people who put that moment in, they did it because it's fun to see Bond go, uh-oh, now I got to deal with this other thing. Blam! And you're like, does he shoot? Does he run? Does he roll? Does he punch? Does he kick? Like, what's the next thing? So I love the idea of a spy game in which... Your, your failure as a, as a stealth operative, your failure is inevitable, right? That your failure is going to happen no matter what, and that's okay. Instead of saying, during the stealth phase, we are trying to find out if you can do the mission. Instead of saying that, you say, you're building up to a more, like an easier success in the next part. Or maybe you are, like the longer you're stealthed, the bigger momentum you have going into the next phase, right? I think the, the crucial thing here is you don't want the game to feel like Metal Gear Solid, you don't want the game to feel like 
um, Hitman or Splinter Cell, right? Because the way those things play as video games is sneak, 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 fail, load, sneak, 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 fail, load, sneak, 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 snap the guy's neck, sneak, 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 fail, reload, right? It's this like jumping thing and it does not, it's not fun at the table. It does not create, it's this game over, start from the checkpoint, solve the puzzle thing. Do not use that model, right? Just don't because it's built for video games and it's treating stealth as a puzzle. You need to treat stealth as a narrative phase just like rising action or denouement, right? Stealth creates an advantage, but you want failure to be something that, that you can roll with. Because if if your whole game falls apart on sneak, 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 fail, arrested, taken to a prison in Russia, tortured, killed, fun. That's a fun game. I'm excited about playing that game. Now, you can you can have stealth create like failure still you can fail forward with stealth it just means you should have been stealthy longer but now you have to do this other thing and i have to tell you i have to tell you uh namhart i'm super excited about the idea of like a two-sided character sheet the whole game your your entire game could be built around that like i would i would name this game like something slash something right like like that to me, that flipping point, you could call the game like fulcrum or something, right? Because like that, that flipping point is super cool where you, you are one person until we tip the fulcrum and now we got to find out what other person we are. And those two characters should be able to pass resources back and forth. So you accumulate intelligence or whatever during the, during the stealth part, Right. And then your inevitable failure happens and you pass those over to the action version of yourself, right? And yeah, over Overboard Gaming and chat pointed this out and I realized as well as I was saying it, Fulcrum is a great name for a spy agency. You can have that, right? Call your game Fulcrum or if you want to be really like futury about it, F-U-L slash slash C-R-U-M, right? Um, but yeah, call your game Fulcrum and, uh, have that be the fictional agency, your members of the, or like agents of Fulcrum or whatever, and then have like, talk about tipping point, talk about building, talk about like building pressure that flip and then build your whole game about moving from phase to phase, right? Mission assignment phase, stealth phase, action phase. Do we go back to the stealth phase? Yes, we do. If not, then we move on to the climax and we do the thing. Like, there's there's lots of ways to structure this that I think would be really cool. Um, and I I I really like, I really like, and I, I really think that that things like momentum mechanisms. I think things like building up a charge. I think those sorts of things are really great. Um, and and I think there's a game. Uh, what is it called? It's Will Hindmarch's cyberpunk game and everything is preset. It's it's like uh, Monster Girl 1244 where like the characters are set, the opening scenario is set, but it's essentially a flowchart game of scenes where you go from one scene to the other. The hell was that game called? Anyway, it's got some good division. You play cyberpunk uh, operatives and it's 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 very interesting in the way. Always never now. That's the that's the game. Yeah. Um I think that's what it's called. Yeah. But those, those games, there's lots of, there's lots of games doing weird things with that. And, uh, you should, you should look at the, look at the stuff you are trying to emulate, right? Watch a ton of those movies and make notes, not about what's going on in the movie, right? Not about the, 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 the plot, but the narrative flow, right? What kinds of scenes and what order are they in? Right. So watch, watch a, watch a James Bond movie, watch Skyfall, watch something else and, and pause and be like, okay, so the first scene was an action scene. The second scene was uh, an introduction scene. Then we had an act, a stealth sequence. Then we had an action scene. Then we had a love scene, then another action sequence, then a stealth sequence, then the climax, then the end. Make that, make a note of what types of scenes there are and do that for like 
as many spy movies as you can possibly jam into your brain, right? And then think about where the flip part is. I mean, we joke, but you could also make a game based on James Bond called the spy and his lover. And it could be like you have the spy side of your character sheet and you have the lover side and the spy does all the sneaky fighty and the lover does all the other stuff. And you have two different character sheets, but like the, I love the idea of the flip flop of the like, uh Oh, this is a new kind of scene. You're not, you're not the engineer anymore. Now you're the demo man, right? We whoop, we flip it over and, uh, and, and do that. And then look at how that works. Right. Um, and think about the ways you can pass things between the characters. I'm just giving you free game mechanisms, but I'm also doing that thing that most play testers do that you should ignore. I'm giving you solutions, right? Instead of just giving you feedback because I don't have anything to give you feedback on except your concept. So hopefully this will encourage you to think about the narrative structure of your game. My personal opinion is that moment of like, we they, they made us, that moment of getting busted, that's important to the flow of a narrative about spies. So keep it, don't try to avoid it, keep it. I like the idea of the, the, the flip where you're like, I'm not in stealth mode anymore. I uncloak and now it's fight mode. I think that's totally fine. There's lots of fiction that does that. I mean, hell, we could use this for a Sailor Moon game. So, you know, do it, do what you want. You can have that. That's, that's, that's for free. That's yours. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully today's episode helped you find a new game that will, that will help you map out your campaign Hopefully it's inspired you to like have a long talk about your short campaigns with your GM uh, or uh, or or maybe you just got thinking about spies or Sailor Moon magical transformations. I just you know, all I got to say is that if the next James Bond movie doesn't involve a magical girl transformation sequence. What's the point? What's even the point? <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. This has been episode number 90 of office hours We're closing in on episode 100 that's so exciting you can if you'd like submit your own questions about magical girl transformation daniel craig if you want to uh at www.adam-coble.com slash office dash hours just click that office hours link fill out the form record your voice we'll probably say nice things about it and uh and i'll, I'll answer your question in a future episode but that's it for today uh thank you for coming everybody we'll see you next time for more office hours have a good one.